guys. Welcome to another edition of Director's Cut. Um, I'm your host, Jason Weber, with my partner in crime, Jenda Rice. And we got a great group of panelists today to talk about summer camp and child care in a COVID-19 environment. Jen, take it away. Um, <laughs> okay. I should have prepared a little intro like that. I don't have the radio voice. I don't have any uh, bells and whistles. No. Uh, Nice, Cindy, like the mask. So we're just gonna start, uh, like we said, we wanna get to know each of you. Um, I know all three of you, but I know a lot of folks who don't know your history and stuff. So if we can start, and it doesn't matter what order we go in, you guys can jump in one at a time. Just tell us a little bit about your um, past history, like where you're, uh, where you're born and raised and um, where you're working now and some of your hobbies and activities that have kind of led you down this career path and uh, influenced your adult life. So if anyone wants to just start, that'd be awesome. Who's in? Sabrina, Sabrina, go. I'll go, I'll go first. The young one go first. Who's going to manage this? <laughs> Uh, so I was born in Portland, Maine, raised uh, in Freeport, graduated from Freeport High School. I, um, uh, early on, I was involved with youth sports. I was, uh, went to, you know, Freeport Rec, and I really wanted to do summer basketball, but they only offered it to boys, and my mom talked with Russell Packett at the time, and um, he allowed for me to join the boys basketball summer camp. Um, which was very intimidating and I learned I sucked, but <laughs> I stuck with it. So that was really my first introduction to uh, youth sports. It really helped me growing up. Um, and I think that's why I definitely gravitated towards this kind of career. I uh, first got introduced when I went to SMCC. I needed an internship and my coach at the time thought that it would be great for me to intern with the South Portland Parks and Rec. And um, the rest was history from there. <laughs> Cindy, your turn, go. Catch. Um, okay, so back in the other century, um, I uh, grew up in Aroostook County and I went to Umpy and I was gonna teach history because that's what girls did. You were either a teacher or a nurse. And I wasn't going to be a nurse. And um, anyway, a history, history teacher. And until I was in intramurals at Umpy and met friends who worked at the Bangor Y Camp Jordan, I know I grew up under a potato barrel because I didn't even know that overnight camps existed. Didn't even know, and one, you could do that, and two, you could get paid to do that. <laughs> Oh my God. So I did my work study at the Bangor Y, Camp Jordan. Uh, changed my major immediately to recreation. Did an internship at the uh, Outdoor Education Center, part of the YMCA of the um, Greater New York. And then I did my senior practicum at the Fairfax County Park Authority. At that time, it was the gold medal award winner down in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Had no idea I was going, where I was going, no map, no nothing. Got in my car in Presque Isle in August and drove to Virginia where it was 95 degrees every day for the month of September and I had nothing but wool fall clothes with me. Um, had a great experience there, came back, uh, was gonna go to work for Nature's Classroom. I was gonna be an outdoor environmental educator and the Presque Isle Y, Royal Goheen, God rest his soul, at Umpy was the chair of the board at the time and said, no, 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 you're coming right back here and you're going to do this. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going back there. And he said, yes, you are. And I did. Did that for a couple of years in Presque Isle. Then I went to the Rochester YMCA where I was a girls camp director. Said it's quite possible that at YMCA Camp Boss in Barnstead, New Hampshire, Gender Rice was a camper. I believe she was a camper there the year before I got there, but Gender Rice was a camper at the camp I was a director at. And then I left the Y, uh, got married. One of those things that happens on the way. Um, went to Sanford, worked for Marcel. I was the uh, per 
Oh, we, we lost you, Cindy. You're frozen. Got a bad connection, I think. Uh oh, yeah. When we skip to Scott, and then hopefully she'll come back. <laughs> She's frozen in a good position there. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. I'm going to take a picture. Oh, there she She's goes. back. There She's oh, back. She's back. Finish. She's back. All right, Cindy, you came back. Oh, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> you were I frozen out. like this. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Yeah. So, yeah, I worked for the Y. I worked for you missed the whole story. So it's too, too, I don't even know how much to miss. Are you? Am I frozen? Yeah, yeah you, you've got a bad connection. I don't know. Are you on Wi Fi or, or uh, plugged in? I am on the Wi and the Wi Fi is, you know, my, my Wi Fi says I have a strong signal. They're lying to you. <laughs> They're lying. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Maybe, can you tell that you uh, you work for Marcel in Sanford as a program coordinator, and that's where we lost you. Go to the window, so. Yeah, I worked for Marcel. Go toward the light. Huh? Go toward the, the light. light. <laughs> I'm at the window sill. Look. <laughs> so, anyways, um, yeah, worked for Marcel. Um, I to Gorm, came here, been here ever since. Almost 30 years. They said it wouldn't last. May not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott, you're next. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I grew up in Portland, Maine, and I've uh, I've lived in four places in Portland, all a mile from where I originally was, um, my original house. So I have not gone too far in that regard. Um, I spent most of my childhood doing track and field. And then in high school, I started coaching track and then eventually became like the summer director in the Portland Track Club for uh, a long time. Um, my parents made certain that I did a lot of community service stuff. So I spent a lot of time working with folks in Special Olympics and uh, just a lot of different uh, volunteer things in the community. Um, other things that I love to do, I love to uh, rock climb, uh, played a lot of years of ultimate frisbee, uh, and my goal in life is to try everything um, that's legal, and we'll leave it at that. Um, but I just uh, just spent a lot of time in, uh, I guess, community service type uh, stuff, uh, and then I went to Daring High School, uh, then I went, uh, spent some time up at Umpy, not at the Yay! same time. Yeah, woo woo. Um, I chose to drive up there as my introduction to college instead of actually visiting in advance to see if I wanted to go there. Um, I'm not sure what that was all about. <laughs> That's right, it is a long drive. Um, and uh, had some fun experiences up there and then finished my schooling at USM with a degree in therapeutic recreation. Um, and lots of other things, but I'll just kind of leave it at that. Excellent. Scott, and since you're already talking, let's uh, go with the next question. What advice would you give someone that's interested in um, pursuing career in parks and, parks and recreation? Yeah, um, so I believe in anything that anyone's going to try is to spend some time with the professionals that are doing it. So whether it's, uh, so if you're in high school and you're thinking about this career path, or even if you're out of high school, is to spend time with people in the profession volunteer, do an apprenticeship, see if you can do an internship. Uh, but um, if I had to do things over, I think I would have spent more time looking at things I was interested in and spending time with people that uh, know those fields uh, before making a career decision. And I, I think I would have got here quicker. Um, I guess that'd be my best advice. All right, Sabrina, how about you? best advice you'd give to someone um so the best advice i can give someone is you you got to try it and you got to do it for more than just one day i mean we all have those summer camp counselors that come on board all gung-ho and then day one they quit you know you really try and tell them we'll stick it out for a full week see how it goes but 
Um, you know, and there's so many different divisions and categories under a parks and rec department that just because you tried working with seniors and it's not your cup of tea doesn't mean that there isn't still a place for you in, in the greater scheme of the department. So being open to adjust and change um, and, you know, if you need to go to the pool for two weeks and learn how to do something there or if you're out to the beach or if you're in the gym, whatever it is, be open to, open to anything. Um, and if none of those things are for you, then you should probably go to the library. <laughs> All right, Cindy, words of wisdom. Oh my goodness. If you're just coming into this field, you better be hanging on to your socks because I really don't know um, how it's all going to work out here. I can tell you changes in the, well, changes in my time doing this. And I've been doing this. So I did the Bangor Y, and then I did a New York Y, then I did Prescott Y, then I did a New Hampshire Y, then I'm in municipal government. Um, we have come through so many gyrations of what is, whether you call it community recreation or parks and recreation or community service, whatever you call yourselves, we're all in the people business and we're all in trying to improve quality of life for the people around us. So whatever. Oh. You're frozen again, Sin. And she was getting to the good part too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, technology. Jen, you want to try the next question? Yeah. Oh, oh, she's in back. Frozen <laughs> again? Yeah. <laughs> so you, community, whether you call yourself community recreation or parks and recreation, we're in the people business, improving and, quality of and, life. And, and, and it has changed due to social media. We never dealt with that before. People were kinder. People picked up the phone or they came and saw you. Now they would just as soon tramp you uh, underground and get a whole storm of stormtroopers with them, all six of them, who become the vocal minority. That's the tough part. That's where it gets tough. All right. Did it freeze again? I suck at this game. Yeah. <laughs> it's not great. So um, let's move on to the next question. And I'm, I'm curious, I know we all do things in our daily lives that the general public would have no idea that we actually do in our jobs. So can you think of one or two things that you have to do in your, your job that people would just be totally blown away that that's something that you handle? Yeah. Cleaning the bathrooms, uh, especially when you're mid event and there's thousands of people on site. And if someone makes a mess and those are the only facilities that you have on site, someone's got to do it. And um, definitely I'm a lead by example. And if I'm going to go in and deal with the shitty mess then you know if I ever ask you to do it you can remember the time that I already got my hands dirty so that sometimes people are just mind blown that it's something that we we have to deal with um I can jump in um yes. Cindy's <laughs> making us see I just, I'm just watching I'm watching Cindy walk around <laughs> um so I I think uh you know bathrooms is a good start <laughs> i think that uh the idea that we there's really nothing that we don't do right like whether whether it's working on um physical stuff and trails and ball fields and going to meetings and seeking grants and i, I think that uh just having um like if we had a hat for all the different things we do we probably wouldn't have a be able to keep it on our head would be so heavy. Um, so I don't know if there's anything under the sun. I think the, the bathrooms is probably the worst of the things hopefully we have to deal with. But um, I think, and then also just making a lot of decisions, right? That um, we're, we're in leadership positions where we have to make decisions on so many different levels and try to advocate and all that good stuff. Great. 
Thanks. Cindy, you're up. Let's see if uh, we can hear you. Okay, I'm as close to this little airport thing as I can be. There it is. Um, yeah. What, yeah. All those fun jobs. This morning I had to go wrestle a guy at Public Works for a one-ton truck. I won so we could get the mulch so we could take care of Roby Jim and the soldiers' monuments for the weekend. Um, cut the trees, clean the toilets, build the booth, build the whatever, uh, drive the bus, be the programmer, answer the phone, pay the bills. Um, we do it all. And we happen to manage local access television and the senior meal site. And uh, right now we're delivering lunches to our seniors as part of the school lunch uh, program during this COVIDness. So there's, uh, there's always, always something, always something. That's why you get to hang out doing it for a while. No two days alike. All right. And it seems like your connection is a little bit better now, Cindy. So you can have the next question too. In all the years you work in the profession, uh, what is the best thing that you do on a daily basis or, or that you enjoy doing part of your profession before we get into the topic? Oh my God. The, the best one thing that I do. Yeah. What, uh, do I get, doesn't count going home, right? I, I think uh, so. <laughs> What was the uh, what was the most challenging day that you ever had? I, I think challenging was, day. I've had one. Well, I've like had the, several. The best the best day in your career and the most challenging. I think is yeah. really what that question. Most challenging was um, a while back. Um, we had a a terrible terrible gym accident here, where a ten year old girl, while waiting for parents, we were coming back from um, an early release. We had gone roller skating. It was in the winter. Kid went in the gym, got the crank, cranked the basket down. The basket and the backboard itself, glass backboard, came out of its sleeve. The crank took the brunt of the fall, bent it in half like a paper clip, and struck the 10-year-old girl in the back of her head. Unconscious on the floor, backboard laying on the floor. Kid comes running. Oh, my God. The basket fell on the kid. Um, staff run in, sure enough, yeah, backboard laying on the ground, kids laying on the ground, rescue comes. Um, I was just home at the time. You're frozen again. The, the end of that story is she survived. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you at home who were Thank God. wondering how that ended. <laughs> All right, Cindy, you're back. What? Oh, did okay, what happened? Does she make she, it? She, she was laying on the ground. God bless Lee Thibodeau. She survives a skull fracture um, and goes on to be an athlete at uh, Bryant College. Ends up uh, several other traumas in her life and is now on a uh, circuit of athletes and um, trauma and such. That day, if you haven't been standing in Maine Med looking at a CAT scan of a skull fracture of a 10-year-old girl that was in your care, um, the worst, worst, worst day ever. Put safety straps on your backboards. And can you think of the best day? Or was that both best and worst? The best day came four days later when she woke up. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. The best day, the first time we got mentioned in a, in a little old lady's obituary. Um, I think that's the pinnacle of a career. When they mention you, and, and she loved going on trips with Gore and Recreation. And this lady was just a saint anyways, but um, yeah, there we were in the featured obit and mentored in that woman's obituary. That was, that was a, uh, that's a day. Nice. Scott, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, Cindy, you are adorable, I have to say. <laughs> uh, I'll start off with my best. Um, so a couple of years ago, we had an opportunity to buy a local camp 
um, from the Auburn YMCA. And uh, when we had our special town meeting, um, we had a, the vote was 176 to six. So that, you know, after all the years of working for the town, having, uh, being able to present something and having such support uh, has allowed us to do a lot more things over the last couple of years with summer camp and stuff. Um, and I'd say the worst thing, um, we've definitely had some injuries with some kiddos. Uh, none of them stand out. None of them were great. Um, but I would say um, uh, there was a time uh, a few years ago where a, one of my bosses did not have my back. And I'm sure we've all been in those situations where leadership above you, um, uh, when they when you don't have when you don't have someone's back, uh, you don't know how far you can fall. So I uh, that was a un, unpleasant experience. Person's well out of the the town's business, so life's better that way. Yes, thanks, Sabrina. You're up. So I think I think I would say the best day or days is. Uh, I think we all work in this profession because we have passion for it and it generally completes us. And it's a thankless, tireless job. So when you are acknowledged by your peers, um, that for me sometimes is that, you know, moment of be being humbled through a lot of the things that we do on a regular basis. And uh, to other people, as Cindy mentioned, that is really all they have sometimes in life. And that's their hope. So being acknowledged in that way is always one of the best days. It makes you reflect um, and kind of have that moment of appreciative. Um, I think the, the worst days and, you know, I it's being a, a younger director is that anytime it comes to budget cuts and layoffs are probably some of the best, I've, not the best, the, the worst days and the worst conversations. And, you know, there is a difference between firing an individual and laying off an individual. Because when you, look, you fire someone, they know the consequences. They knew that there was something either being reprimanded for, and there should have been those checks and balances along the way. And they could have, you know, understood that this was coming. A layoff is a little more of a blind side. And when I was introduced into this, this career path, you know, the recession and layoffs was a reality and I was so young and I was on kind of the, the low end of the totem pole trying to understand it. And I, there's a lot I didn't understand and having to gone through that process, I think has prepared me. I wouldn't say helped me. I would say prepared me for now having to be that decision making person. And it's very hard and difficult because as a director, we always try and build a team-like atmosphere and you feel like a family member is leaving you and it's your decision. And that's a very hard pill to swallow, especially given today's circumstance. So that's the worst. All right, thanks. So um, let's kind of get into summer camp talk now, um, now that we've, now that we know more about you guys, um, why don't we just take one at a time, if you can just tell in a typical summer, what would your summer camp experience be like for kids? Like how many camps do you offer? Um, we're talking like day camp, rec camp, um, more so than specialty camps. And how many kids, where are you? Um, kind of activities that you do and just kind of give a little overview on a typical summer, what that might look like. Sure, I'll, I'll start off. So um, here in Auburn, we a typical summer is we uh, would have our kindergarten camp, which is at a typically a school location. Then we have our first through third grade camp, um, which is usually also at a school. Um, that is one of our biggest camps. We have well over 100, maybe 125 kids at that one location typically. Um, and then we have a fourth through sixth grade camp uh, here in Auburn. Our middle school is seventh and eighth grade. So that's why we've structured our camps with those grades. Um, so our seventh and eighth grade camp and our fourth through sixth camp is usually held here at our community center in Pettengill Park area. Um, and that 
we're probably average combined about 100 to 125. So in total, we're a little over 200 um, on a typical anywhere from 225 to 250 because we do offer week options. Um, and uh, I would say um, that I think before I, before I got here, um, the Auburn camp sometimes, uh, you know, God bless the person that ran it before me because he was a true rec person running on a show, shoestring budget. And so being able to pump some additional resources and funding into the camp, we were able to then increase trips and additional costs or, in, or anything that was needed for camp um, to kind of help shape and mold it into a little more than just be dropped off in one location and stay there all day, which is what the summer is going to be. But <laughs> so we were, you know, on our way up and, and kind of building it up in a, a very positive, um, changing a few curriculum things instead of just playing dodgeball all day, add some STEM programs and stuff. So um, that would be a typical summer for us in Auburn. All right. I can go next if you want. Okay, great. Um, so uh, in Poland, uh, we used to operate out of our elementary school, and in 2000, late 2017, we purchased Camp Connor. And uh, just real quick on that, um, the, the way that happened, I made two commitments to the town, our taxpayers. One is that every year we would pay back a portion of that purchase price. Um, it was just a creative way to get support. Uh, so every year we pay back $14,000 to the town and that's going to take about 15 years skipping this year um, And then also that all of the first five years of any capital improvements that we did would be money that we raised um, separate from taxpayers um, and uh, I think the folks in town appreciate that we're doing it that way uh, but anyway Camp Connor it's a uh, it's on Lower Rang Pond. It's about 12 acres of land, including the beach. Um, we have a beachfront. Uh, we've got a, kind of a private um, peninsula that you can hike out onto. It has great views. We've got a big field. Uh, we built a stage. We built an obstacle course. Uh, we have a archery area. And then we also happen to be right next to Camp Tall Pines, which is special to the Mains camp. And they've been super gracious. They let us use their waterfront for our boat launch. So we have, uh, over the last couple of years, we've acquired 23 boats between uh, kayaks, canoes, and rowboats. Um, and then we also use the basketball court. Uh, we do some partnership stuff together, um, but we, we're really an outdoor camp. Um, and uh, just, uh, we take about, Normally 115 kids, uh, we're gonna lessen that a little bit this year and uh, grades going into first grade all the way through eighth grade. We have a CIT program. Last year we had 12 CITs, this year will be smaller. Uh, and we have typically, uh, uh, normally around 20 staff for 115 kids and we're gonna reduce that a little bit this year but not too much because uh, we have to have certain specialty folks uh, running camp like waterfront director, lifeguards, um, and et cetera, so. All yours, Cindy. Uh, that's amazing. Camp Connor, back in my, my other YMCA days, I had gone there to visit friends who were the caretakers for the winter. This is like 200 years ago. We had oil lamps. It was, that's crazy. And now you own it. Um, so let's see. Last summer, we were hitting our stride. We had two, average 220 kids a day. Our Teen Extreme camp was for grades, entering grades six, seven, eight, and some nines if they wanted to. Um, our junior camp is first grade entering first grade only. And then our kids camp was grades two, three, four, um, entering grades two, three, four, five. So um, a lot of kids, um, three sites. Julio runs the program and he has three camp directors on sites. Brian um, Pecchio is one of them at Teen Extreme. We have two buses that uh, we own that are hand-me-down school buses. Every time they kick one out, our guys at the garage take them and hybrid them and get a sticker on them. We paint them white and we ride them till we can't. 
and then we get some more. Um, we've been doing that forever. This year we submitted our two relics, a 2001 and a 2004 special international bluebird bus for the VW um, diesel uh, grants. Um, and we got funded for two propane buses, two brand new propane full-size buses. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, that we won't be doing the hand And she's out. She's out. <laughs> so that's, we got a glimpse of what summer camp was prior to COVID-19. Now let's go to this year. What does camp look like for you guys this year? And since you're back, Cindy, you can start us off. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know when it's frozen. That's kind of funny. I see you guys all staring. Um, <laughs> this year. Four sites, 43 kids, seven staff per site, total 50 bodies, six outside hand washing stations per site, seven campers, one staff, each get a bag of equipment of their own. They uh, sanitize in, sanitize out, wash their hands, wash their hands, wash their hands, wash their hands. And then when they're done, they're gonna wash their hands. The day trip will be to Shaw Park. I'll be the waterfront director. Gail will be the traveling arts and crafts guru. Ben will be the traveling sports guy, and Julio will still run all four of them. And that's that's our plan. Uh, temp in, temp uh, while you're there, keep the chart. Um, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's gonna be, can't never get on a bus. Well, there you go. That's so better than you. Have fun. <laughs> Scott, how about you? What's, what's camp look like for you this summer? Yeah, so um, a lot of the similarities that Cindy just mentioned, a uh, lot, of, lot of washing your hands. Um, so uh, uh, drop off and pick up is going to be a little different. We're not letting parents out of the car or sibling, you know, only the campers will be allowed out. We'll sign them in, sign them out, do temperature checks for staff and kids. Uh, we're keeping we're putting four 20 by 20 tents on our property. So between the shelters we already have extending from our main lodge, we're gonna have um, kids instead of going uh, to their group at like nine o'clock, they will go to their group immediately when they get there. All their belongings will be kept separate. There'll be a specific list of what they can and can't bring to camp. Um, we are gonna be doing a lot of soaking of things that get used, uh, toys, uh, we're going to laminate playing cards, uh, anything you can imagine to have camp be as fun as possible, but also making sure that we're following all the safety precautions. You know, we're assuming staff are going to have to have masks on them or face coverings and, and uh, wear them at uh, certain times or most times or possibly checklists might say all times. Uh, we're also going to supply campers with face coverings, um, but we're not you know, it's not something they're going to be wearing all the time, but we want to make sure we have them available if we need to. Uh, the way we play activities, uh, we're making a list of activities and uh, either ones that we did last year that we're making alternatives for or just, you know, there's lots of stuff on the web and we had a great session yesterday. Uh, social distancing type activities, but still be able to have some fun with it. And um, we're bringing in more special guests this year. Um, our camp was not planning to do a field trips. Uh, we did three last year and we had we decided that we were just going to make this an outdoor camp and not hop on any buses. So we're going to focus on bringing in more special guests, math and compass. Um, we're going to, we have somebody that's coming in to do some drama, performing arts, uh, all that kind of stuff. And again, following the, the proper social distancing to to make sure we do it as well as we can. Excellent. Uh, um, I saw your outdoor your outdoor sink that you had priced out. That that was lovely and and stupid money. This is ours. Stupid money. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we can have all tons of these, and these are seventeen dollars and ninety one cents at REI. <laughs> and um, so that's our that's our plan. We're going to have a jillion of those. 
So talking about buses, not getting on a bus, we do have a question from an attendee. And before we get to Sabrina's summer, uh, this is for Cindy. How are you getting to Shaw Park? Just walking or are you actually going to get on a bus? Uh, yeah, multiple, multiple trips because 20 seems to be a number. That's what the school department is using right now for fall school um, planning. So it's, you know, it's one to a seat and we'll just make multiple trips. And, you know, we got our, we have a full size bus to do that with. So we'll just have to break them down group by group. I mean, it's only less than three miles from anywhere where our camps are. So that's how we're going to get them there. Excellent. All right, Sabrina, what's summer camp look like for you this summer? So some changes we've made is that we now are going to be operating out of six locations. We'll have a max of 40 campers um, that will allow for at least six to eight staff members and then one or two depending on site because the schools are more than likely going to have a janitor in it or not. Um, we have decided to hire a nurse or some kind of a medical field um, uh, position. Uh, we've talked about it in the past, uh, but this definitely seems the per perfect time to go ahead and, and put that in place. We'll be increasing our daily cleaning. A lot of touch points will be multiply, will be cleaned multiple times throughout the day. Um, one thing that we've uh, kind of recommended is trying, if you are going to be able to trace the kids that has a, a symptom or sign or confirmed case and how are you going to track that through your whole camp so it's they're going to be in a routine they're going to be going to the same group with the same kids in the same area contacting the same equipment but never letting that you know uh, do cross contamination with any other groups so you are going to get cozy with that group that you are put into with camp this summer um, We've had to put Max on our uh, camp list, which is you know kind of a first for us. We've always been, we'll take as many kids as we possibly can. And we've now had to, <laughs> we've now had to change that, which is a little tough, a tough pill to swallow, but it's uh, understandable. We still have 178 kids that are signed up and have not wanted refunds. So the, de the demand is there. People want to send their kids to camp. They understand the risk and the assumption that it's gonna come with that. Um, but a lot of uh, training and education, parents are going to need to know. Uh, it's almost like they're going to need to do a 14 countdown day countdown to camp because they're going to need to learn and understand what symptoms and signs they need to look for because we don't even want them to come to camp and let us make that decision. It needs to be happening at the home level. Um, our, obviously, our activities will be changing to, to not be as, uh, to limit as much uh, contact as possible. Um, and uh, our goal is to have the kids as, outside as much as possible, trying to limit the indoor space when they're confined into a small area. Um, we, are, we work with the school department for the busing situation. So if they allow for us to use the buses, we'll do short trips just locally, more of a staycation themed um, here locally so we can walk to it or make uh, constant shuttles like Cindy's uh, kind of suggested. So um, we'll be doing a lot of exploring, getting to know your backyard kind of things. All right, great. Um, so there is another question just about um, registration and wondering, you guys have all reduced your numbers for this year and it sounds like some of you have already taken your registrations in, but um, Cindy, I know you're not starting yours for another couple of weeks. Are you planning to do some kind of a lottery system in order to, um, or is it just going to be first come first serve? This is really, really hard. This is... Um... You know, 40 kids can sign up and come for the whole summer and that's it. You know, we're full. And you know, that we, we've, we've tossed this around a bunch of times. I, I, I really don't know what we're gonna do. We're not opening registration until June 1. We bumped it way out there. One, to make sure we were gonna have a camp. Two, to make sure we weren't just turning around giving people money back. Because if you signed up online and you paid your money with a credit card, we paid a bank fee on that, plus we had to pay it to give it back to you. So we just held off. Um, I don't know. We're, I mean, we're, we're looking into our, our uh, DHHS kids, uh, trying to do some preemptive work with that. Um, try to, you know, we, we have 
we have a handle on who they are, at least based on our after school program. Um, and we need to um, come up with a number, an acceptable number, you know, that's how do, what are the age groups? How do we spread them out evenly? You know, I don't know. We got, we got, we got like what, 10 days, not even to uh, get going on how we're really going to do that. But it's worrisome. It's worrisome. Frozen, aren't I? No. No. <laughs> uh, I can jump in next if you want. Um, so we started registrations in January and things were flowing. Uh, the MyRec software is nice because you can go in and look at what you what day you were at a certain number last year and, and see where you are. And we were like just on target. Boom. Pandemic hits. Um, you know, we kept promoting people to register. Don't put your deposits in. You know, let's hold off on the money, but let's make sure we know we still have a certain number of kids coming to camp. So when we get closer to making decisions, uh, the decisions around staffing um, and what we have to do for the property and stuff would be easier. And, uh, but anyway, so registration's kind of halted. Uh, we've been having some trickle in. Uh, we've been keeping in touch with our families about trying to register. Uh, we'll do it for you over the phone. We've got scholarship money um, that we've been raising uh, every year for the last couple of years. Um, and then uh, this week, uh, my awesome coordinator, Vanessa, is reaching out to all the families that have signed up just to say, hey, you signed up for nine weeks. Are you still planning to sign up for nine weeks based on what we know? Um, just so we have that kind of baseline number. And then once we've got the green light, which we hope, we all, we're all assuming tomorrow we're going to get this beautiful checklist. It's going to answer all of our answer all of our stuff. And we know that's probably not going to be completely true. Um, but anyway, so we'll get that checklist, be able to have a green light, uh, be able to put that out to our families and uh, not just the families that have registered, but the families that haven't registered and say, hey, now's your chance. We got X number of spots left. Uh, get in there before it fills up. Yeah, uh, we opened registration in January. So when this whole thing hit, we had two camps already over 50. So that's that was where we decided our kindergarten will be maxed at 40. Um, our first through third grade camp, we decided to keep that open till 80 registrations. And I think we got seven left, seven spots left. We automatically knew we were going to need two locations anyways. Uh, same with the um, four through six camp. We were just over 50 at that point. So we knew we were going to need two more for that. And then our seventh and eighth grade camp, um, we'll max that at 40. We usually only get 20, 20 kids or so, which is what we're at right now. So I don't anticipate that number going up too much more. But we open up super early because with our demographic, people have a hard time paying that much money up front. So we do like an early bird registration. If you pay in full by March something, you get $200 off, which if everybody did that, we would we would lose money. So, so thankfully there are always those people that decide to wait. Um, but unfortunately now with them waiting, they now don't have jobs, and all of our scholarship money has gone uh, was gone back in in March. Um, so uh, thankfully our CDBG uh, program they have additional funding that's coming in that's specific to COVID related items, and uh, we were able to get an additional hopefully 25 to 50 grand to help with summer camp uh, expenses this summer, but uh, we're still waiting pending that approval. So we'll see if that happens. Well, the CDPG, uh, the patron saint of all municipalities except Gorham. <laughs> with summer camp yeah. right around the corner, um, staff training is very important to all of us. How does that look like this year? In person, online, new hires? What kind of encompass all that in one question is what does it look like this year? And we'll start with Scott. Yeah, so uh, I mean, fortunately, we had majority of our staff coming from last year. So we just had to fill a couple positions. Uh, we had to uh, find a new waterfront director, which we, I'm going to say it was a miracle. Um, but we've got our, our staff in place. They're just all waiting for the green light to know they have jobs this summer. Um, and then uh, we have less CITs that we're planning on this year for obviously obvious reasons, but we are gonna 
utilize folks. Uh, so as far as training goes, uh, I'm going to say it's about 50% online where it's going to be um, our, our director happens to be a behavior specialist. So she's kind of uh, a lot of the stuff that she can do can be uh, through Zoom meeting and uh, some Q&A back and forth. Uh, and then about 50% uh, as we get closer to camp, our camp starting on, uh, if all goes well, on June 22nd. So we will start meeting at camp to, uh, one, get camp ready. Uh, we're, uh, I've got myself and a couple other people that are doing kind of big projects at camp, but when we get closer where we have to do like cleaning, how the tents are gonna be set up, the tables, all that stuff. So that will be part of our, I'm gonna call it team building. Um, and then uh, doing some in-person stuff to talk about the different parts of the property, how, um, you know, how, how are things the same? How are the things different? Trying to figure out, because um, the, the, the piece of the formula is we can put all these things in place uh, what isn't always predictable is children's behavior, right? So we we can we can separate this, we can do this, we can do that. We can say, hey, the nurses are going to come to the groups, but the instead of the kids going to the nurses or whatever, but uh, we can't guarantee that kids are going to stay their space or not put their hands on other kids or try to give the staff a hug or all those things that are you know typical of camp. So. We just want to try to vet as many of that stuff out on the property as well and, and figure out how we're going to work those things out and try to focus on praise and uh, avoid as much consequence uh, as we all go through this. Am Any I help? good? No, you're I'm not good. Probably. You're good. <laughs> okay, so um, Julio's going to hold a town hall style meeting here out in the parking lot. And the parents that register, we're going to invite them and the staff are going to be here. And everybody's going to sit in their parking space and we're going to have a Q&A. And we're going to talk about those kind of, those very kind of things. Now, we could put some suspenders on hula hoops and the kids all have to stay in their zone or, you know, whatever. Um, I love the hat thing. Jen sent me uh, the restaurant, you know, the hat with the pool noodles on it. So there's your, there's your zone. Um, yeah, we can't guarantee everything. We can minimize what we can minimize and we can be very aware of it and we can be very diligent about it. And that's our plan is, is to do that. It's also in our disclaimer that if your kid is having too much difficulty, you know, either adjusting to this whole thing, we might not be able to let your kid come. Um, I mean, it's going to go both ways. It's going to go both ways and we're going to try to figure that out. But I think having this, this town hall meeting of parents uh, where staff will be all lined up on the sidewalk out here and they'll be in the, you know, we'll have a PA system set up and everybody will get their question and kind of get a feel for, okay, they, you know, they put a lot of, lot of work into this to try to figure out how to keep everybody safe. We want everybody safe, staff and kids. You know, Gorm doesn't need any more COVID than anybody else does. So that's our, that's our diligence and that's what we're hoping. And, and you know, who, we're all on a wing and a prayer here. We just really have to be super uber diligent about it. Yeah, some things that are uh, pending again, what we get for guidelines, but we are hoping to do in-person training uh, for those who need it. Thankfully, a good portion, almost all of our staff is returning from last year. So that's a, a very easy positive thing. If we do any in-person, there'll be much smaller groups. Um, one thing that we have been given as guidance from our safety coordinator in Auburn is that we need to have on-call staff or additional staff prepared for that case that all of a sudden you got to send five staff members home instantly. Who's going to take over the kids and your backup, fall, you know, your fallout plan. Um, so those are things we're putting together now. Our parent night usually is on site. We allow the parents to go through the spaces and stuff. We're going to do a little more virtual uh, stuff with those things. We'll do a pre-recorded thing so everyone can see their own space and basically live in the day, uh, you know, a life in uh, what camp's going to look like and how some of the changes will be. And again, it's all about educating the parents ahead of time what they they need to be prepared for. Um, if we're positive about it, uh, you know, we can help send that message and talk about it in a positive way. Um, we understand that our disciplinary uh, action plans and stuff will need to change a little bit because some kids are not going to know and understand 
the no touch concept and some of them are going to and I hate to say this, but it, you can't just yell COVID and you can't just go cough on someone. You know, it, as much of an active shooter is a serious topic, COVID right now is a very serious topic. But it's explaining that in age appropriate, you know, words so that way they can kind of get and understand it, but not get anxiety and overwhelmed by it. That's going to be a difficult line for us to, to handle, but there are tons of free online uh, seminars and webinars and stuff like that that the Red Cross and a bunch of others are doing on behavioral and social health and around COVID. So we are definitely looking to implement that into our training process. Um, and we're looking to kind of switch our refund policy. If someone wants to come try camp out for a week and then just kind of realize it's not for them, we'll issue them a full refund. And then if they get two or three weeks in, we'll do prorated from there. I think it's, uh, you know, the best that we can do, we understand that not everyone's going to, this is not for everyone. Some people are going to just take the summer off and spend it with their kids. That is awesome and great for them. We encourage that if they can. And if not, we are here for those individuals. We have been given the support from both administration and the city council to move forward with these things. We are trying to put this stuff together very quickly and early because everyone thinks that we can just pull events out of our you know, back pocket and stuff, they don't realize how many months it takes. So when we mentioned back in April, we're still planning these things, they freaked out and they're like, no, you can't do that. And we're like, but, but yes, we need to, because if we are going to pull the trigger, we got to plan now. So we had the support back then that if we want to, and are able to June 8th, we're going to open up for a small, basically a test run of summer camp, two week camp that is just going to be offered to city employees we're working on getting that funding offset so that way no one has to pay for things. Um, and then we are going to, you know, test out our policies and go from there. All right. I, so Sabrina, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but um, wondering if each of you can just take a, a quick minute or so and just tell about how you decided to uh, how you came to the decision to run camp this year. I know a lot of people are starting to make the decision not to run a program this year, and I wondered if you could just share what your process was like. And it looks like Scott is frozen. <laughs> but he's not. It's Cindy's gone. <laughs> okay. What's going on here, guys? Everybody just left. <laughs> All right, what was the? I apologize. I got a. I got a text that I actually want to read to you guys. So, what was the question? <laughs> wow. Is All it right. Friday yet? This feels like a Friday. <laughs> my question. My question is how did how did you all land on this decision making? Some some uh, departments have decided to not run a program this year, and I'm wondering what your process was like. Just kind of briefly. I know we're kind of getting late on time here. Yeah. Um, so in, in regards to where we are in Poland, um, you, you know, my, my philosophy, and I think we all, you know, all probably have something similar in recreation field in general, and that is um, why not? Um, and we, we can't just leave it at that. So the, the why not is how do we come up with a way to do this? And um, I was concerned about, uh, you know, summer camp for most of us is we're providing childcare for families and and uh and if it's beyond child care it's uh, experiences outside of their home so you know kids can have a you know a an enjoyable summer and get you know an awesome memories but uh right now it's really focused on uh, making sure that um so sort of two parts one is the child care piece and the other is just uh what's driving me this time around is i'm worried about the isolation that kids have had at home uh, it's been uh, several months, and uh, and I use my daughter as an example. She's not been in one of one of our cars in nine weeks, um, and I think you go to the grocery stores, you're not seeing kids for for the most part. You're not seeing many kids with parents, and so you're just assuming that we're all keeping our kids at home. And the longer that happens, the harder it's going to be for them to leave home and for those parents to kind of dispel that fear. So that's kind of what's driving me right now. I think we thought we were, we would always be doing something. We just didn't know what. Um, the more enterprise funding your department is and rely, reliant on revenue generating activity, the more 
creative you get to push that out there. Um, 40 kids is, is easy. 40 kids not going anywhere, not being able to intermingle is difficult, very difficult. The responsibility is huge. Um, I think the onus to our community is just that. If we're going to be the canary in said cold mine, uh, and the kids getting together before they go back to school, I mean, somehow we've just, we've just become the skinny pig. And um, uh, we can take it in little tiny chunks and, and we can, uh, we can, we can accomplish this. Our community needs this. The kids need this. Um, things are, you know, I, I, God bless anybody who's been doing homeschooling and working. And I just. And you're frozen. Sabrina, you're up. <laughs> I think it freezes on her when her time limit's up. It's like saying, you're done, Cindy. Your story was a little too long for this question. You just got to talk faster. <laughs> Jason, are you freezing her? No, I wish I... No. Uh, All right, Sabrina. Um, uh, so for us, it was, again, never a question of if we were canceling. Uh, I will say between the demand, the amount of phone calls we fielded from the very beginning to make sure we were still having camp because that is a good portion of how people can work still in the summertime. So the demand was there. And again, you have when you have supportive staff, uh, my program coordinator, Donna Daigle, she is a bleed summer camp. And just the thought of not having summer camp like gave, gave her anxiety because this is what she lives for every... so every year so having that support from staff the returning staff and then having administration and you know city council the politics and stuff on your side is very very helpful and very easy for you to get that thumbs up school department said this will give you you know schools and access so when every everyone's seeming positive and they want it it's what we do if there's a demand we'll find a way to put it together so excellent I, Jen, do you want me to take the next question? You got. Go um, so, God forbid, we go into summer camp and a child or one of the staff members comes down with it. What's our policy? What's your What's your direction? This one This one's every on everybody's mind. Everyone's so, okay. So okay. I've already been given the guidance and this is how I've started to provide the guidance is that it's not if it's when and what are you going to do to contain it to trace it to make sure that everything is taken care of following a step list so that way it's controlled and contained quickly and then so it's your reaction to it don't go in thinking if because the thought that you can control what parents and kids do outside of camp let alone your counselors is not is impossible you can't control where they go what they do or who they get in contact with what you can control is how you react when that situation happens in camp and that is going to be your backbone on what people are going to anticipate when they come to camp and that's what they're going to hold you accountable for if and when this happens so having that game plan and stressing all right, parents, so when there's a confirmed symptom, these are the steps. No need to freak out. I want you to be ready for this because if, if we're able to go through camp with no confirmed cases, hey, we got lucky and won that lottery. But the odds are we are all going to get affected at some point in time, but it's how we handle it. It's almost like, you know, I never yell at my, play, my players as a coach to make a bad shot. I would yell at you for how you reacted after you took that bad shot. That's kind of the mentality that I'm going into it with because I, you can't control everything, control what you can and be prepared and in that mindset of, okay, well, if, it, if it's gonna happen, we're in COVID mode, everyone gets that text and everyone knows what to do. And unfortunately, I hate to say it, it's like a, a, a lockdown shooter type situation it's an instant you go into that survival mode and you try and again you control it you contain it and then you recover from it cindy how about you yeah we fully expect that we're not you know there is going to be a symptoms somebody 
is going to have the symptoms, whether it goes to all the way through to become a, a confirmed case. And testing is, you know, so much quicker and now readily available. And as the summer goes, that's going to get better and better as well. We're we're in that same that same mode. Um, first call is if it's a, you know if it's a staff member, here's our protocol. That first call is going to be the CDC. This is our case. Tell us what to do. The camper, the parent calls, yeah, you know, somebody in our household has been exposed at their workplace. Okay, your kid can't come. Bye-bye. Now we must tell everybody else. And who do you tell and who's the teller? And what's the message? So that has to be laid out. So everybody, when it comes about, it's the same script. You write a script and it's the same one. And this is how it starts. It starts with the CEC. This is my situation. This is my tracing. This is where I am. Where are my next steps? And then you follow that. Um, and and so if it comes from a household, if it comes from a staff, um, that's that's our plan. If it comes from, um, we're not planning to have too many visitors come see us, but those people will have to be vetted before they come to see us. Like you know, uh, the wild sparks arc animal man, um, you know the whatever. Um, so those those are things that we have to deal with too. But that's that's what we're going to do. We're, we know it's there's going to be exposure, and we're going to have to follow the rules. Scott. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, I, I think in regards to, um, I think we're all going to have a very similar checklist that's going to come from the CDC, and they're already out there for all the different you know groups that have gotten their checklists. Um, so I think uh, that's obviously would be the game plan if we actually find out that somebody has the virus. I think one th one thought that I've just had for a while is we could go a long time, you know, because kids can be asymptomatic and some adults can be asymptomatic, is you could go four weeks into your camp and then find out that somebody actually has the virus. So. Um, I think that's that's going to be the trickiest part. Um, I think for some of us, it might be the end of your camp, uh, depending on how your camp set up. And then um, if we're able to figure it out soon enough, then maybe that just, uh, you know, that plan that goes in place is for that particular group. Um, I'm running into a couple situations where we already know we have families that are signed up that are from out of state. Uh, it's not unusual for kids that come up and visit their grandparents that live we have a few bodies of water in Poland uh, and they can sign up for camp and they have signed up for camp and so we have uh, those families I've uh, been in touch with that uh, they are going to have to quarantine uh, before they come to our camp and then um, and then I'm starting to get questions like hey we were thinking of week three or over the weekend we're going to go down to such and such state and visit our family and if we do when we come back, are we going to be able to come back to camp that following week? Um, and that's an interesting, you know, for one, it's great that they're asking the question. At least they're being thoughtful of it. Um, it's also um, something to think about that I could see a lot of families, either they have family that come up to Maine from out of state um, and hang out with them, or they go out of state to visit their families, and we may not know anything about that. Um, they may not share that information. It's like finding out first day of camp that no one provided any information that somebody has uh, medical or health issues that so sometimes that happens. So, uh, so we, 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 end, we may end up putting some information. I'm not sure what that will look like, but I think we, we're going to try to figure something in writing to say, uh, to be cognizant and to communicate with us uh, those types of situations. But I'm not sure, like, that's a good question. What do we tell those parents like you you come you go out of state you got to come back and quarantine for 2 weeks it's different than um, you live in Massachusetts you're coming up to Maine and you know under certain phases you have to quarantine which is right now 2 and 3 uh, or actually 1 2 and 3 um, so that'll be interesting but uh, lots of uh, lots of following uh, the guidelines with pay grades way above us all right, I have uh, two questions that I'd like to try to keep kind of quick if we can, um, and they're two totally different topics. One, uh, cleaning supplies, and if you have any recommendations on what to order and where to order it. And the next question has to do with unemployment. All those people who used to work for us in the past and have every summer, and now we don't have jobs for them this year, 
and filing for unemployment. I know I'm starting to get a lot of questions about that and I'm sure you are as well. Wondered if um, any of you had any feedback on that. And if you don't, you don't have to answer it, that's fine. But um, if you have any guidance on that, so go. Cleaning supplies, our fire department, they have the decontamination stuff and we have the pumper spray can. Like at the grocery store when they hit your um, shopping cart, we have that, we get that from the fire department. We do our refills with them. Um, cleaning inside, the disinfectant, spray the doorknobs, the touch points, all that. We have all of that. Um, and we have a lot of it on hand. And again, we are ordering through our fire department. They have access. Uh, the unemployment thing, we're actually, it's taking us more people to run our show this summer. They're not a bus driver, but there's more people. Um, so, you know, when you expand your sites, we lost our economy of scale there. So we have a few more people. We have had people apply for unemployment though. Um, and we're a self-pay through Maine Municipal. And um, so that's just gonna be how that's gonna go. Um, I guess I could jump in. <laughs> uh, so um, in regards to the unemployment piece, uh, right, just what Cindy just said, um, I've had that conversation with our, our, our HR department is actually our finance director. Uh, welcome to Small Town USA. So um, we, we had that discussion a few weeks ago and the question was, um, if staff are not able to work, can they file for unemployment? Uh, we cannot deny anyone sending in unemployment um, applications and uh, town will probably get hit for a portion of that. Um, I believe the unemployment is based on your last five quarters of work. So if you had somebody that worked for you last summer and two weeks into summer, we had to stop doing camp and they filed for unemployment, then uh, you're probably going to get hit for a percentage of that, um, is what I understood. Um, but uh, our town did not want to send out a letter telling folks, this is what you need to do. But if somebody asked me, I'm going to say, hey, file for unemployment if that's if that's the situation. Uh, in regards to supplies, um, we are uh, we ordered a bunch of stuff. Some of it's come in, some of it's back ordered. Uh, our fire department was not as gracious, Cindy, even though they're awesome people, they are making sure they have the supplies they need to do what they're doing. Uh, so I've got two different people that are constantly on Amazon, and then there's also a couple local companies that are uh, trying to pull the trigger for us on certain supplies. So we are doing, you know, gloves, masks, wipes, antibacterial uh, things. Um, thermometers, sprays, um, all of that we've been thankfully been able to work with our fire department and our safety coordinator and he's making sure that we are completely stocked and ready um, for that. With unemployment, when this first started uh, instantly, because uh, the rec department is the one that um, employs the most part-timers in the city of Auburn, uh, 10 to 15 of the first people to apply for unemployment were from the rec department. Um, so uh, that may have, you know, yes, we have to pay a portion of that um, unemployment benefit that they receive. And I, I think we are currently up to just under 20 to 22 people that right now are uh, actually collecting um, that are, you know, deemed rec department staff which may be why everyone's pushing for us to open up camp so that way they come off the unemployment benefit, but I have no idea. Um, uh, but, but yeah, the one big thing that we did just go through with our HR is that if, if we have a part-time staff member and they are, you know, come down with the symptoms, they need to stay home sick, whatever it is, they're still gonna be paid for that day and you need to replace them. So that's something to think and keep in mind when you build your budgets is again for that um, you're gonna have to pay the staff regardless and you're you're gonna need to figure out replacements so whether that's you personally or the rest of your full-time staff or you have a pool that you pull from um, just uh, be prepared for that in your budgets all right any, any uh, other questions from anyone uh, who's listening who wants to ask a any kind of final question you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom um, otherwise, last question for you guys is, um, 
what's one one thing about you that people would be surprised to know about you that they don't already know i do not have the ability to smell never have born that way it's weird <laughs> solid congratulations <laughs> <laughs> So my, my follow-up question, follow question, what's the first thing that you smelt then? Like, what is the first thing that you remember? Like, oh my God, that actually smells good or bad. You can't smell. Nothing. 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 Nothing? Zero. Nothing. It smells nothing. Wow. Even when Wine you told me it could be poop, it could be peppermint. Wouldn't know. That wow. is it. I know it's a superpower. It's amazing. <laughs> all right, Scott. Um, all right. I, I had a few of them, but the uh, one that, um, so when I was around 20, I, I thought it would be a good idea to have a professional boxing match. <laughs> and uh, one of the stupidest things I've ever done, the, the guy I fought was an alternate on the South African Olympic team in 1988. And uh, we, uh, basically beat the crap out of me, and I couldn't go to college for two weeks. So, but I, I am I am thankful to be alive. <laughs> Sorry. This is amazing. I'm just saying, <laughs> this is great. I'm gonna keep mine basic. Uh, <laughs> I don't like chocolate, and I'm not a cat person. Excellent. That's lame, Sabrina. I know, well, I, I can't really? beat those two. Uh, no one needs to know that much info about me. It, or you already know because you joined the conferences from way back when. All right. Well, guys, thank you again for joining another episode of Director's Cut. Um, check out MRPA. You're not frozen, Cindy, anymore. <laughs> MRPA. Uh, on our website at merpa.org. You also can follow us on our new YouTube channel. Thank you, Sabrina, Scott, and Cindy. You guys are great. Uh, until hey, can I just mention one thing, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just got this from my town manager, so this might pertain to some of the communities. Um, tomorrow at 515, there's going to be a emergency county commissioners meeting with a very specific subject, and that is for the county commissioners to support private and public immediate opening of RV par parks and campgrounds. Ooh. That, I would, that might impact some of your communities. So, um, But they've opened it up to other people can um, go on that as well. Um, I can, I'm sure all the county commissioners are passing that on to all the town managers um but uh, i think anyone could go on it excellent it will affect a lot of communities including mine again thank you guys again see you next uh tuesday at 11 for the next director's cup bye guys bye